Pavel, um, I'm going to start with you, which, sadly for you, I'm going to start with you. Um, I, 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 uh, we, we, the, the, the title of this d uh, uh, discussion is How Will the Current Trends Play Out Across CEE? From, from what Petr said, from what we've seen and read in the newspapers over the last year, I mean, how do you rate the current perception of risk in this region in terms of politics, in terms of economics, the wider range? I mean, I remember at, at, at MIPIM, at the real estate conference that, uh, in Cannes, people said to me they were confident but cautious. Is that, is that how you would sum things up? I would say this, that within the last um, couple of weeks or a couple of months, let's put it this way, since MIPIM, what we have observed was a trend that we have not seen for some time, which was going to Hungary. Hungary is definitely back on the map, despite your friend, Mr. Orban. <laughs> I don't have any friends. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah, but the, the, this, despite the, the political climate in Hungary, I think this market actually is now extremely dynamic. Within the last, I would say, two months, we have uh, received instructions on five large transactions in Hungary. So it's five times more than during the entire 2015. And I know we are not the only ones who do the transactions over there, so I would say this is the market that is going uh, with great dynamics. Uh, it is possible to borrow money, uh, especially office market is everybody's darling because no, nothing has been constructed for, for years. Uh, the rents are relatively low there, uh, I think the lowest uh, historically. So everybody sees a potential growth. I already have clients who bought in 2015 and sold with the yield compression. So this will be, I think, the story of, of this year. Uh, I think Czech Republic uh, is still everybody's darling because actually it is perceived as a very stable country. Not much of a, pol no political risk really, uh, it's going one way. Uh, I've just heard exactly one hour ago on the radio that in a survey about the Central and Eastern Europe, Czech Republic replaced Poland as number one, um, unfortunately, place uh, to invest in real estate, which, which is a shame, but it is what it is. Uh, we'll take it back, I promise. <laughs> uh, Poland, uh, I think there was a very short moment of, of uncertainty, uh, but I would say the deals are now flowing as they have flown, but everybody is cautious, but it is rather related to the market. People think about politics, but it's some, somehow still there. It's, it's not really uh, on the front. You don't see transactions like you see them in, in Britain now. I saw a deal in Britain where there was a Brexit clause which said, if Britain leaves European Union, there is no deal. I can walk wow. away. Wow. And I will not name the buyer. It's a very large fund in, in Europe. I saw this uh, in writing. So we, you don't have situations like this. But definitely uncertainty could theoretically in the future. Because I would say, I would say nothing now. If this continues, if there is more uncertainty in six months, maybe 12 months, it will impact the market. Today, it's rather about just simply pure economics, you know, where is the, there is the demand for uh, office space, secondary cities, Warsaw, saturation, but these are all normal things related more to the market than politics. Fascinating, thank you. Uh, Martin, how do you, sort of following on from that, how do you, how does someone like you price in political risk? Is that, is it an occupational hazard in this part of the world or is it, is it something that actually sits against long-term fundamentals on a ledger? Yeah, actually it's both. I mean, the banks, we are obliged to rate each credit internally. We have credit rating system. And within this credit rating system, we also have a, a point which says something about the political risk. And uh, I'm, I'm with Pavel. Um, Czech Republic at the moment is, is uh, number one on the list. Um, when you read the news today that the European Union is strengthening its legal procedure against Poland, yeah, I think um, it will be difficult for Poland to catch up with Czech Republic over the next, as you said, six to 12 months, certainly. And uh, I think um, if such kind of negative news continue to be on the press here, yeah, I think the, the rating in the banks but also the, the, the sentiment for Poland, um, especially on the investor side, will definitely change. Um, when the, the, the new laws came in place or were discussed in January, um, within our bank, I mean, we had to report to the board what is happening now. 
what kind of impact could this have on our existing portfolio, on the market, on current business, on new business. Um, and we clearly made a decision at the moment, the long-term perspective is very good in Poland, GDP grows more than 3%, so we continue business. But certainly, as Pavel said, we have it in the back of our mind, and we carefully look at the market, in the market, at the situation, and if there are some changes, um, I think we will also react to that. And we have already seen one uh, um, impact from the new laws, the margins here in Poland for investors have increased. And this is a clear short-term issue, but I think it will remain a long-term problem. Thank you. Ioannis, as, a, as someone who works for a company that invests across the region and, and, and even further afield, how, is it a question of percentages? You know, if you're looking at potential projects around, is this just one more thing you have to worry about with Poland? Or, or is it something that, in, in a long-term perspective, you're happy to ignore? I mean, we're talking about sort of Hungary coming back into fashion. Is that because Poland is going out of fashion or is it independent? I wouldn't say that investing in real estate is a, it's a fashion thing. Uh, I remember back in 2012 when uh, I did the only institutional investment in, uh, in Hungary, everybody was saying that, you know, you are crazy. I mean, you are entering in a country where the politics are on the, on the wrong direction. You are buying a product that is, okay, it's of institutional quality, but it's, there is some vacancy, the market is slowing down and everything. So, uh, last year we sold that product, we sold that investment with a huge uplift in, in terms of uh, capital value, so we made a very good profit. Uh, I wouldn't say that that was an, a, an easy decision back in 2012, uh, but w what we were seeing uh, is that the risk associated with politics was not that dramatic as it was uh, presented in the press or in the European politics. And as it, in it evolved, let's say, uh, you can say that politics, the way it is happening in Hungary, the way it is happening today in Poland, it's a calculated risk. So, uh, these governments took some decisions that were in their own direction regarding the constitution, regarding personal freedom, or whatever, but effectively they didn't affect a lot the economy. What happened in, uh, in Hungary with the Swiss franc uh, and Fiorin exchange, of course it affected heavily the banks. I remember back in 2012, even in 2013, discussing with some uh, friends from German banks to refinance our investment and they were saying that forget it, Hungary is out of, uh, of favor because of all this. Today these people are on the ground feeling better, willing to do business. Um, we started investing in Poland back in 2013 when things were very uh, lavish here and very uh, positive and we continued doing investments last year and we will do investments hopefully this year as well. Um, I think that the whole situation in Poland with the change in the, in the government and uh, what happened recently, I would say that helped a bit the, our sector because uh, the volume cooled down at the beginning of the year and the pricing that, in my view, in some cases is overheated, you know, put uh, some brakes on, on it. So uh, if nothing, let's say, weird comes looking forward in terms of politics, I think situation uh, will carry on being like this. Uh, in terms of uh, short-term or long-term perspective in CE, I believe that uh, after so many years of uh, big investment volumes and all the large institutional players being active in the region, I think that CE is an established market. It's among the uh, investment universe uh, of uh, the global investors. Not only the direct investors, but also the ones that are investing in our funds as well. So everybody has, wants to have some exposure here. We need to keep in mind that CE is a diverse uh, space. Not all the countries are the same uh, between each other. I mean, you cannot compare Poland and uh, Hungary, for sure. Uh, there are different dynamics, so we, we will all have to be cautious, and I don't find this a, you know, mm. a, a bad thing. Yeah, but Yanis, what is going to happen if, if Poland continues, let's say, on this negative path with new laws, with uh, let's become more investors unfriendly? 
I mean, the money cannot only be shifted to Hungary or to Czech Republic or probably to Romania because the markets are much too small. So what is going to happen with the money then? You are right. I mean, if uh, things go bad here, I mean, global capital is, is moving very fast, so they can change location. However, this is not always easy because if you go to Hungary or Czech Republic and try to place 4 billion or 6 billion euros that are being placed in that market, you can't. The markets are very shallow and you cannot find, uh, you know, alternatives. So maybe you have to take a look at other regions. Uh, you are right, capital is moving. Uh, if political situation here goes the, right, the wrong direction, things will change. So the overall volume in the region uh, will, uh, will be decreased. Yeah, we will have be seen Czech Republic being benefited by this situation. We saw the volume last year and beginning of this year. So in my view, this is also explained because of the Polish politics. But at the end, if the situation here in Poland doesn't go right, I think that the volume, the region will shrink. Uh, uh, Petr, I'm keen to bring you in, but just, Pavel, on, on that point, do you think there is an argument that, that there aren't markets like Poland left, uh, that, so many of them, and if you want a market with scale, you want a market where you need to deploy that kind of money, you have, you, you've got a choice of going to Poland or nowhere? Uh, also, the market that is slightly still cheaper by, what, 100 plus basis points in Western Europe, of that scale, I wish I could still say, and the certainty and the legal security, and I'm like choking when I'm saying that. I hope it will continue like this. That's, I, I think when, when, when you said the new laws, I, I would not dramatize today, because today nothing has happened. It's what we are afraid that may happen. The tax on banks, okay, we know how, how it is not paid, or okay, it will have an impact on margins. We all know that. Tax on sales, I still think, I'm, I'm not sure I will see it happening. Even if it does, okay, it will affect a little bit of retail here, retail there. Uh, it will probably actually affect more small retailers than, than the large ones. But I, I think the risk is uncertainty. And when you have this new law on uh, tax avoidance schemes, that they should be disregarded. When you say that, bear in mind that every country in Europe has it. The problem is the last change in this law that says that not only that not your structures that you created in the past are subject to this law, they aren't, but your tax outcome of those structures, if it happens after the law introduction, is. So theoretically, it doesn't act backwards, but actually in practicalities, yes, it does. And now the question is, is it going to be abused or not? If not, then okay, we will see what the practice is. But this creates this uncertainty, and that's what I'm afraid of. Yeah, I think I think a lot of the worry here is is, is about rhetoric, and it's about positioning rather than about concrete. Uh, Petter, I mean, I'm keen to bring you in here because uh, a lot of your presentation was about about macro issues as well. I mean, do you think that sometimes the politics is overblown a bit, and there are actually bigger dark horses stalking uh, stalking the region that we should be more worried about? Well, uh, I actually do think that the political risk uh, is, um, the perception is greater than the actual risk. I agree with what was said before. Just to give you a little contrast of what is meant by political risk, we can look at Russia or Syria. Uh, there's probably no chance of expropriation of property in Poland or Hungary anytime soon, right? So, so um, unless uh, you, the governments start taking decisions which um, are biting economically, which hasn't been happening, and they don't seem to be moving in that direction. Uh, with you know, one example, in the one opposite example was Hungary, but Hungary had to do something about those mortgages and foreign currencies, so they had to resolve it. So it was not necessarily a popular decision, but it had to be done. And Poland has been facing similar issues. So, but these are relatively minor things uh, from a bigger perspective. So, yeah, I do think that the political risk um, is smaller than it's perceived to be. If I can comment on, uh, on that, uh, Henry, because I'm coming from Greece where, you know, uh, political risk <laughs> yeah. is the situation from, uh, for the last, uh, you know, six years. We are on the press uh, almost every day uh, for, for bad things mainly. So, yes, media tend to exaggerate things and, uh, you know, to focus on uh, dramatic uh, events. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, there is no, no fire, you know, uh, under the smoke. Uh, however, the persons and the people that are on the ground, you know, doing real estate, doing investments, they have a different perception about this. The problem is 
what is happening with those that are far away from our region, the ones that are sitting in Boston, in New York, or in the UK, they haven't put their foot on, they don't know where the region is, and this is our role and the role of the local consultants and the local players, you know, to defend the situation or sure. to present the actual situation. Yeah, Martin, I was actually keen to ask you that. I mean, how much do you find yourself now almost as a cheerleader for the region, saying, don't believe what it says in the FT, everything is fine. You know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. It will not only be the 23rd of June, it will also be uh, uh, the Spanish election three days later. So here. Um, I, I mean, the, the good point is that, uh, um, but, but Janis is right, I mean, there are some other countries at the moment which are probably more in discussion than Poland, which is sort of a little bit covering Poland and the EU region, Spain, uh, um, and, and certainly the Brexit here. But, but nevertheless, I mean, uh, the, the money from the investors is still a shy idea, and, and they can shift immediately. And how important the sentiment is, I think you could easily see in Spain. Here in Spain, um, some years ago, the sentiment was so negative yeah, that everyone f really flew from the country, was trying to exit. And now, I mean, some things have changed to the better, but if you ask me, not that much dramatically here, but the sentiment is so much better that now everyone says, oh, we have to be in Spain, we have to buy properties there at ridiculous, already low yields here. At, uh, everyone is betting on, 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 the, on the, the rental increase and stuff like that. And I, I think in the next six to 12 months, we see new speculative developments coming out of the ground. But it's more the sentiment. And this is uh, what afraids me. I mean, we saw Hungary. It was a sentiment. Now, probably, hopefully not. But Poland is on the same way. Here. And, and this is what, 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 what makes the, 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 how should I say, what makes the impact. And we internally, we always have to explain, but our board members, they're all reading um, the FT, the, the uh, Frankfurt Allgemeine here. And whenever you open it, you read something negative about Poland. And this certainly does not help neither the German banks nor, as you just said, the investors somewhere in, in, in London, New York, or, or somewhere in the world. How does the government uh, stop that? Or, or does it care? I mean, does it, does it, I mean this, is, this is a fundamental question, right? If it is about PR, do you think the government is keen to change the PR? Or does it think, well, if they want to think that, they can? And how does that present a problem? Uh, for no, I cannot speak for the, for the Polish government, uh, not even for the German one. But I think sometimes, you know, um, they don't care about um, the press the next morning. And especially my feeling from the, from the Polish government is um, they do not care at all. Yeah, they have their plan. Um, they won the election. And uh, now they go straight forward um, what they proposed or what I promised to their to their uh, um, to the people and then let's do it and sometimes in Germany it's the same I'm, I'm not sure that uh, at the moment mrs. Merkel um, um, is uh, supported by by most of the people in Germany but still straight away Pavel, I mean everybody I talk to seemingly in the whole world wants to ask me about brexit I was I was in California two weeks ago and the border guard stopped me for 15 minutes to ask me about brexit my my <laughs> Seriously, seriously. Can you ask a Polish lawyer was, about it, Brexit? Right? I mean, I, I That's was... That's a sign of desperation. Uh, I, um, no, 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 I'm not going to ask you about Brexit. Um, you know, my, my hairdresser here in Warsaw knows that I'm British. She asked about Brexit. I mean, is it the same when you're traveling? They're like, oh, you're from Central Europe. Oh, what's going on with Poland? Is it, is it, yeah, is it, yeah, does yeah, it dominate I, every single time you open your mouth? They want to ask Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've done several trips to visit clients and potential clients within last month. And... Uh, it was really like preparing myself for being questioned, you know, and uh, that's inevitable. You can start, you know, talking about, you know, good things about Poland and it, it will inevitably lead to a question, okay, but what about this? Because many of those people actually have never been to Poland. Sure. So again, they are fed by the perception and, uh, you know, okay, when you say, okay, guys, I understand what you are saying. I'm not saying it's all good, actually. Uh, I think it's very bad when you say, no, everything is hunky-dory, because it's not true. And when you say that, uh, you undermine yourself, I think, at the very beginning of a conversation. But, okay, yesterday the, the statistics office, yesterday or on Monday, I'm not sure, um, published the results for the first quarter. And, okay, there is a little bit of a slowdown in GDP growth. We have 3%. Uh, there is a slight negative uh, foreign, ex foreign, uh, foreign trade balance. Uh, there is a little bit less of investment spendings. People, I mean, uh, business people stock up, so the stock is up. Uh, inventory generally is up. 
Uh, on the other hand, when it was then all analyzed, uh, the explanation is that, okay, the investment is a little bit slower because many of the EU-funded infrastructure projects have been already completed, so that's actually natural, we, we could have expected it, but actually the general comment from left to right was next quarter will be probably 3.6, we will be back in business because the local consumption will be definitely boosted by this 500 watts which will go to the families, they will spend it, it's good news for retail, there will be, okay, why there is more import because, uh, there, why there is no trade balance because there is more import, because people will buy more so they actually prepare the inventory. So. There will be some things in the economy uh, resulting from the current government actions like this 500 watts that will actually boost consumption and boosting consumption will mean a little bit of, uh, of an inflation and a little bit of an inflation is better than deflation. So right. I, I think it should be balanced. Mm -hmm. Johannes, if you could sort of look into your crystal ball a bit, I mean, what, what, what are for you are triggers that could make it even worse? If, if, if certain things happened, it would actually give you pause for thought. I mean, is, is this constitutional crisis an issue if it continues to rumble on, if, if perhaps there are more moves on, on foreign dominated industries? I mean, it, are there things that you sort of have as a red line in your head? Like yeah, I mean, there are uh, things that uh, can be a red flag, let's say, for an investor to, to say, okay, I'm packing my bags and I'm leaving uh, the country. Uh, Everybody is expecting to see what will happen with uh, Brexit, if it will take place or not, and how this will affect uh, the capital flows uh, from the UK or within the uh, European Union or you know, from other locations to European Union. So this is something that uh, everybody is, uh, is expecting. Um, for us, key driver, uh, it's the FDI. Uh, we need to see FDI coming uh, to the country as uh, it has uh, been historically. It's, it's an economy that is fed by this. Um, we would like to see more domestic capital, capital to, be, um, to be developed, let's say, and be able to, to invest locally. Uh, a potential REIT law uh, and uh, you know, this introduction to the local economy will help things. Um, also in terms of banking, we are closely monitoring the developments there. I mean, uh, if the banking sector uh, becomes more, uh, let's say, uh, conservative or if there are new taxes or new um, regulations that will affect their business, obviously we will be affected or our cost of finance will be affected, so yields should be pushed back. Uh, in terms of constitutional um, uh, reforms, what has been implemented so far, it doesn't affect, uh, let's say, directly our market and the economy. Uh, it might affect in the long term if people don't like to live anymore in Poland and they would like to, you know, move outside. So this will affect the economy. Uh, so we are monitoring a lot of uh, indicators, let's say, in order to, you know, to, uh, to do business here. But for the time being, we are, we are fine. I'm keen to get questions from the audience. So if you do have one, please put your hand up just before we go to that. And um, Petr, I mean, you said... You, you know, you don't work for investor services, you work for analytics, and, and I, I understand that. Do, but do, do, you, do you notice increased interest from the outside in Central and Eastern Europe at the moment? I mean, are, are your skills in more demand? Are you seeing increased in interest in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, not, not that much. Uh, definitely uh, from, from the UK. Actually, when we um, look at it as a perspective of business, we actually see uh, economies uh, doing well uh, in Spain, uh, in Italy, uh, not necessarily in Greece, but uh, uh, we see some some uh, demand for our services. Um, in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, this has not been the case. Actually, speaking of those kind of uh, immigration issues, um, we have an office in Prague where we have uh, some 10 uh, people with PhDs. We've got PhDs in Prague, but they're from different parts of the world and they produce stuff that we sell to UK clients. Uh, so rather than actually getting clients in CEE, um, we use the labor. Uh, so I, I don't see that much of um, bigger interest in CEE, not from London at the moment, uh, as far as I can tell. Um, with the impact of, of Brexit, actually, the impact is likely to be very small if, if it happens, uh, because uh, the exports from Poland or Czech Republic to the UK are fairly small, while the exports 
uh, from the UK to the European Union or some 50% of, of the, so UK will be heard. In the short run, uh, CE won't be, but it's a long-term risk. Uh, so on the top of the political risk uh, internally, in Hungary and Poland, you'll get this extra uh, risk that uh, can lead to European Union dissolving and this can create problems. But immediately, uh, there'll be very little impact, uh, economically speaking. Um, do we have any questions on the floor? If you could put your hand up uh, and, uh, and uh, introduce yourself and then ask a question rather than make a statement, that would be great. No questions from the, yes, we have a question, excellent. Um, yeah, gentlemen at the first table that I can't, the lights are very bright, John. so I can't. John, it's John, yeah. <laughs> This is a question for Pavel, because you intrigue me with Hungary. I'm really happy to see you in the middle of the panel, by the way, but uh, the question is, what's the case for Hungary? Um, can you tell me what the yield spread is against Polish uh, yields? I mean, that might account As of for... today, or...? No, I'm talking about the yields on the deals, the four transactions that you referred to. What's the spread between similar product in, in Poland? I mean, isn't that part of the attractiveness? Can you, can you repeat? Because actually, I have the a yield problem spread. in... So, yeah, yields, but which country? Hungary, Hungary, the four deals that H you Hungary, referred to. Okay. Uh, maybe that's part of the story because they got so cheap that you know yeah, this but, has to make sense. But the, but the people who are buying, they are buying because of the yield compression. And you can see the compression of, I would say, more than 100 basis points within 12 months. So uh, I, I think everybody is expecting that they will catch up in Hungary pretty quickly to, uh, to where it was. Uh, you know, the, the, there is no fear of the politics, it looks like, because I can see opportunistic people, but also very, very conservative investors there. So somehow they dealt with their political fears, and uh, the transactions that we see now are even below seven. So, uh, and, and a year ago, I would say seven and a half, seven point eight, what I saw, mm -hmm. but I, I think the yields will be, uh, they are compressing quite fast. Were these international funds trading with other international yes, funds? Yes, okay. yes. Uh, second thing is we focused almost exclusively on the end of the value chain, which is the investment uh, link. We didn't talk about really the occupier market, which at the end of the day is going to drive everything, right? If somebody's leasing the space, it makes the, uh, the product very attractive. How do you perceive, uh, all of you, the, um, the occupier market to be affected by any risk factors that we discussed? But again, in Hungary? I mean, no, no, I'm talking about Central Europe now because, um, for instance, someone's considering to move, let's say, it's a big Indian uh, outsourcing company, right? Central Europe is a home of outsourcing. You're getting to be a very important player. Um, and you consider this word, sentiment. Does that have an effect on where you're going to move your company? As of today, I wouldn't say, but it, it's again, it's about the sentiment in the future, next 6 to 12 months. But as of today, I would say, okay, how many people Credit Suisse hired for Poland within the last 12 months? Several thousand. Uh, suddenly, you see Goldman's, uh, a tenant in the building next door, shared services. And you will see more and more. And according to the study, okay, it's, a, it's an old study in a sense that it's pre-current government, so we are not talking about the sentiment element here. But the study of McKinsey said that this industry would go from 160 they even say to 300,000 people within the next 10 years. I don't know whether it's 300,000, but if it, if it changes, if it increases from 160,000, which is, I think, almost as much, if not more, than the coal mining, coal mining in 70s, which was the biggest industry ever in Poland, if you go from 160 to 200, 250, you are talking about some substantial demand for, those, for, for the office space. And I think, more importantly, what we can see in the tenants market is that those services that are rendered now in shared services uh, in Poland, uh, these are not the simplest services as they were at the beginning. We are talking about more and more value-added services being done here. And I think this is the key. We go from quantity to quality. Yes, theoretically, yes, but you need also, you need depth of the market you need depth of the actually human resources. Look at Wrocław. Wrocław is probably as big as Prague, and there is already not enough people. That's why they jump to Krakow. That's why they jump from Krakow to Łódź. That's why they went to Gdańsk. So 
I, I think you need actually a substantial population to deal with those with the skills. Czechs have skills as we do, but I think the depth of the market, the, the size of the population, the universities are playing in our favor. Um, just on the sentiment point, a very smart gentleman at this conference this morning over coffee told me that to use the Polish example, Polish companies should really be pulling out of the US right now for fear of what happens under Donald Trump and the fear that their, their, their Supreme Court is stifled in constitutional crisis and they're missing a member on their tribunal. So it's all relative. I think there were two questions here. Yeah, gentlemen, uh, there. Uh, I have a question to Pat or to some extent also to the whole panel uh, on the immigration. Um, there is a, a the, the discussion about immigration was here uh, in the light of opportunities, which of course all the crowd here is looking uh, for problems as uh, opportunities. But li I would like to point, point uh, paint a little bit different picture. Um, you know, the, if you take a Germany uh, in the 60s, the, the immigration in 50s and 60s, it was. Uh, it was a wave of very, very different uh, people from different countries. Portuguese, Ita uh, Italians, uh, Turks, uh, uh, Spanish, and so on. So this was just a crowd of people who were quite entrepreneurial, who wanted to improve their lives. Now we have the wave of uh, immigration to Europe, which is very clearly 90% of one religion. And uh, we have to see that the motives of these people are slightly different than, than before. Uh, we cannot be also naive that some of these people will be not linked to, to ISIS and some other things. So my question is uh, whether you can think of that uh, uh, in your ratings, countries which will absorb uh, this amount of, uh, of new immigrations, like in Germany, where the costs of uh, absorbing uh, uh, these immigrants, taking into account the security, uh, you know, just generally adapting these people into the modern society, plus costs of uh, aging, aging uh, society, will bring you to uh, to the change in ratings. That there will be a risk, be risk connected with the wave of of immigrants, and this goes more or less to the whole panel. If let's say events like what happened in Brussels or in, or in Paris will become a sort of new normal, will this have an impact on the real estate uh, um, estimate of the uh, particular cities in terms of uh, the attractiveness? Thank you, thank you. So the question, if, if you guys got it, what's the sort of risk reward uh, uh, analysis of, of, of mass immigration, um, mainly from the Middle East was the gentleman's question, and um, sh should should have a security fear be sort of the new normal in Europe? I mean, you want to take the, the well, I, can, I can comment, I suppose. <clears throat> so this is a question which is uh, uh, how costly is immigration? So if we wait uh, the benefits uh, and the costs, um, so there's one type of cost which is um, with uh, the integration, which can be from one region or from, from a number of regions. And then there's a question of security, which is related, but it's... Um, uh, also uh, slightly different because uh, uh, the question is where, where do you want to stop? Do you want to, uh, security has cost as well. Imposing a more secure environment means some opportunities are foregone uh, because of that. If you have a longer line at the import, it means uh, everybody waiting there. There is an opportunity cost of time. So it can be very expensive and the question is where do you draw the line uh, as a society? and can be different from, from a nation to nation. Um, uh, I think that the cost can be contained reasonably well with reasonable policies. So uh, my argument would be that the cost of security would be fairly minor, I think. Uh, it's perceived as, as a huge risk, but if I make a very harsh comment, so if, if uh, you know, with all this that happened in Paris, those 150 people who were shot at some point, this is one plane falling down right? Uh, it's probably much less than how many people died uh, on that weekend on the roads um, and so on. So do you want to make sure that you're completely safe and essentially stop uh, the economic life from happening? So, so that, that would be um, a big question. And with respect to integration, uh, there are no cheap solutions, I'm afraid. Uh, but I think the, the argument would be is 
it will happen anyway. Yeah, Unless I you just, want to close I, the I, countries. I want, just, just to sort of t turn the question a little bit towards CE, I mean, our, our CE has some of the worst demographics in Europe. Uh, statistically, in 20 years' time, the Polish economy is going to be reliant on 50% you know, fewer workers. I mean, are, are, the, are these countries missing a trick by not taking in? Um, I, I think, I mean, if, if you look at, at the EU first, I think in the EU we have slightly more than 300 million people living. Yeah? And we, Roughly about 350, I think. Yeah. 350 something, okay. So we have 28 countries here. And uh, frankly spoken, when I saw the EU funds going into Poland, going into the CE region, I mean, everyone has to ask, being a member of the EU has to ask itself, you know, what is the EU? Is it more than just a big barrel where Germany and probably uh, uh, the Dutch and probably the UK are putting in some money and the rest is grabbing the money and running away with it? Is this what the EU should be about, or is there more behind? And if you ask me, there should be more behind here. It is also a cultural thing. Um, it is a, 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 a matter of peace. We haven't had any war over the last 70, 75 years now, um, more or less in Europe, probably besides Yugoslavia here. And this is what the price we also have to pay for, and what we also have to consider, and each of us has to consider. Poland, as well as Germany, as uh, Czech Republic, as all the other countries. So it's not only a matter of commercial points, of uh, threat, of fear, of money. That's not all. It, it should be more. And this is, I think, what, what we really should put more into the focus here. Um, I mean, it's easy for a German saying that um, after having 1.2 million immigrants over the last uh, two years, and uh, believe us, in Germany, we're not only happy about that and saying, yes, hooray, um, can we get another 1.2 million, please, here? Certainly not. But on the other hand side, you know, it's good that we did it. You know, we were the front runner together probably with Austria, um, with Sweden. But now I think if we are something, um, if, if Europe, if the European Union is something more than just a commercial uh, uh, group or package here, the rest of the, of the EU countries should now follow. And this is not only a matter of money, it's also a matter of, of moral and ethics. And I think this is very important. And then the next step is, it is a benefit to the countries. It, I think it will be a benefit to Germany over the next 10, 15 years, because we also have a problem with the overaging of, the, of our population. Poland and all the others have. It is certainly a long way. It will cost a hell lot of money. It will go with some kind of uh, threats. It will go with some kind of, uh, of things which happen in Paris and Brussels. But what is the alternative to it? Here, I mean, Poland and all the other countries, they live behind the Iron Wall for many, many years. They know how it is to live on the wrong side of the curtain here. And should now Syria, should all the other countries live on the wrong side of the curtain for the next 30, 40, 50 years? I think it's not a solution. Johannes, final point. I just want to add that, uh, you know, the immigrants are here to stay. They came and they will stay. So we need to be proactive and not reactive as we have been so far. The, the opportunity with the immigrants is that, as you correctly said, the population of Europe and CE is aging. So are we treating this as an opportunity to have, you know, a boost in the economies in terms of uh, micro and, uh, and macroeconomics later, later? We need to be prepared. As correctly said, I mean, this will be a costly exercise, but we have to go through. We shouldn't close our eyes. Uh, we've got time for one final question, so it could be quick and snappy. This gentleman here has hand up first. Oh, we've got two. We'll take two final questions. This, this gentleman here and this, this gentleman here. Uh, who has the mic? Has someone stolen the mic? Stolen the mic. Ah, there we go. We've got a mic. Be, be as quick as you can, please. Hi. Robert, <coughs> Robert Moritz, Company Alta. Uh, from what I hear, you take it for granted that investment in real estate, the way it goes right now, is, uh, is a good thing for Poland. And we are worried that it will be less. Now, my point and question at the same time to all of you, are you sure it's a good thing? From what we heard on the, be the session before is, we listened to how New York is well planned and well thought out and they're considering every new development and every new investment. Now we know our cities are not well prepared and are not well planned. We don't have master plan for majority of the areas in the cities. And they are being developed in two major directions, which is retail and office, destroying the 
the basic structure of the city. So we are building cities of the 20th century and the other part of Europe and the world is already in the 21st century. So my question to you, do you consider quality of investment in your forecast, in your thinking about uh, economic forecast of a country? Is the way the investment is being done, the way the office buildings are being built, what is being built, how it's being built, how it connects with the environment, how it creates the space for people, residents, Will people work happy or will they work not happy? Sure. That, do you think about it and what are your remarks on this? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question uh, turned on. Do, do you, uh, did you hear that? It was, you know, do, uh, do you consider the social impact of your investments when you make them in the real estate industry? Is it simply just about yield and return? Yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, we, we're the bankers, so we can only finance the projects which are existing or which have to be developed. I like that silence. But, but what, what, what I can certainly tell you is that when I look at Poland, also Czech Republic, when I see all the new buildings, and most of the buildings, if not all of the buildings in the meantime, are certified. And this is something where I think um, CE was one of the front runners, really, so that people really thought about carefully about the environment here. Here. I mean, in Germany, it started as well. Um, I'm not sure that uh, so many buildings in Germany, um, existing ones at least, do have a certificate here, while um, the new ones are, it's, it's becoming more and more common that also new developments have one. But um, on this perspective, when it comes to the, to the green initiative, I think Poland and Czech Republic um, have clearly been a front runner, which is pretty good. I think that this question is addressed to the wrong panel a little bit. Uh, but having said that, uh, I think, okay, if everybody, okay, many people here remember how Poland looked 30 years, 35 years ago, 40, 40 years ago, some of you, maybe. Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> so for me, the question is quite obsolete because I remember how it looked 40 years ago. In terms of the social impact, I agree with the question, I agree with the concerns, and I've been advocating this every time I could in every at every public meeting, at every public gathering. This is the role of the local authorities through spatial planning to force the developers, because developers, believe me, will adapt. Yes, they are like, they, they really will adapt. They will find a way, they will build new buildings, they will follow the master plans. If the cities in Poland, in Czech Republic, in Hungary, produce their master plans and have a vision how every city would look like, this question would also be obsolete. But again, this, this is something, and I agree with the, with, the, with the concern behind the question. This is something we should really push the cities to do their job because they think that their job is politics. No, their job is to adopt the master plans, to make people to invest in places where they want to create office hubs, retail hubs. It's really not the problem of developers that there is no high street retail in Warsaw. The problem is that the city has never created the structure of the master planning that would allow, allow the, master, uh, the, uh, the high street retail in Warsaw. So, I think this is our job as Polish citizens and real estate community to make the, the cities aware that this is their main task, to put the master planning in place. Yeah, I, I mean, I fully agree. I mean, there's one good example in Poznan where you have two shopping centers, one with almost 100,000 square meters and one with 60,000 square meters almost next to each other. For me, this is completely stupid planning because it will cannibalize one or the other. It will definitely result in the loss of uh, um, jobs. It will result in, 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 uh, uh, in bankruptcies by, by probably smaller uh, entrepreneurs here. And, and it, it's only because the developer is doing what is allowed to here, but the city has to control it and has to make sense out of it. And this is certainly nonsense. We're, we're being ushed off stage. So just finally, the last word, very quickly. Uh, to be straightforward and honest, I mean, when we run our spreadsheets, there is no function for, uh, you know, social <laughs> responsibility and things like that. I mean, we try to maximize our profits. However, as correctly Pavel said, 
I mean, this takes two to tango. I mean, it's on one hand the investor, the bad investor or the bad developer that wants to maximize the density to get maximum profits or whatever. And on the other side, you have the city, you have the authorities that regulate what you do. I remember 10 years ago in Bucharest, where you can apply, you had a plot, and you can apply to increase the density of three times and create a skyscraper of 200 meters high. This project might not be economically doable or viable or sustainable or whatever, profitable. But somebody wants to, you know, have the density, try to sell the plot with a higher density and things like that. And at the end of the day, it might happen as a project. So, at the first glance, nobody is looking at, uh, at the sustainability, let's say, or at the social impact of what we do. It's the role of the state or the role of the city authorities to do it. What we have seen lately, and I'm closing with this, is that uh, we have seen a, a trend towards green buildings. This is a costly exercise and a costly investment for the developer or the investor, and this has become a trend that everybody is doing. So, in all our portfolio, we have green buildings, we have accredited certif certified buildings and everything. You have tenants that are asking to, to be located in, in buildings like this. So, it's, it's something that is evolving and, you know, it needs the hands of the regulators as well. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for your rapt attention. Well,